Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. Listen for the word of the living God as we read these words. They came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you whole. Immediately he regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. The living God still speaks today. Speak to God. I heard a comedian, and he was lamenting that his wife never answers his questions. He'll ask, do you want to go out to eat tonight? She may respond, I can be ready in 15 minutes. Or shall I change clothes? Or perhaps, do I want to go out to eat tonight? None of those answers his questions. They're all responses. They just aren't on the same wavelength as the question that he is framing and posing. He has to work out then what is not stated amid those responses. They have to be interpreted. He has to work out the context, the underlying message, and evaluate the meaning behind the words actually being pronounced. A meaning that lies far beyond simply their definitions. Not every question conveys the same thing. Even if the words are exactly the same. How closely do we pay attention not only to the words, but also to what lies beneath them? Mark mentions Jericho in this account. Remember, that is where Joshua's spies had entered the promised land to report back on what they faced upon crossing the Jordan River. The Hebrews were uncertain over what lay ahead for them. The previous generation had sent spies who came back, and after their report, they determined it would be too difficult to take over the land. They had turned back at Jericho to wander another generation throughout the uncivilized territory between there and Egypt. Joshua's spies spoke with Rahab, and they heard her declaration of Yahweh's impending victory. Rather than taking Yahweh's word through Joshua, the people took her word as the confirmation they needed to trust Yahweh. She wasn't even one of God's servants, was she? As Jesus is leaving Jericho, a blind man by the roadside raises a ruckus. 
Bartimaeus is not in the least put off by his blindness. He refuses to be silenced by the crowd that he is actively disturbing. The more they shushed him, the louder he became, crying out and asking Jesus to intervene in mercy. He calls Jesus son of David. That's a declaration that we have not heard elsewhere in, John, in Mark's gospel. It's a declaration of trust in Jesus that reaches beyond where the disciples seem to have come. It emphasizes Jesus' role at the head of God's reign. This is no title that Jesus has claimed for himself. This declaration of trust stands out as unique among all of Jesus' encounters with those who were following him. Jesus stops. He halts his journey upon hearing this man. That is also something different in Mark's descriptions of Jesus' interactions. He doesn't normally stop and stand still. When he does, something significant is going on. Jesus halts the procession and he summons Bartimaeus before him. Our attention, as well as that of the disciples and the crowd, shift. They shift to Bartimaeus as he makes his way to Jesus. There were plenty of needy people in the crowd. It's easy to believe and imagine that. There were many people in Israel who were needy. People in Jericho, in the surrounding territory, in the towns and villages. It was not uncommon for people to become ill, to be injured, to struggle with some disease. Jesus was constantly bombarded with pleas for his attention, for healing, for comfort. With Bartimaeus, however, Jesus' response ramps up a level. It's as if Mark is telling us, pay attention. Listen up closely now. Don't miss it. Hearing Jesus had called him forward, Bartimaeus flings off his cloak, which was likely also his blanket, his sleeping mat. It was his only protection against the elements. He throws it off, however, to make his way to Jesus, unburdened. The crowd made a way for him, guiding him to Jesus, wondering what in the world Jesus was up to. When he made it before Jesus, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Now, I don't know what about you, but that is not the response I would have been seeking. Everyone knew Bartimaeus was blind. What could Bartimaeus possibly want from Jesus? That's not a very hard question to answer or figure out, is it? What could he possibly want other than or more desperately than to be able to see? There is no way that you can convince me that Jesus could not recognize that this man was blind. Jesus had encountered blind people before. Two chapters ago in Mark, he had healed a man who was blind. John recounts a different story of Jesus healing a man born blind. Why would Jesus ask what appears to be such a stupid question? He already knew the answer. Everyone did. According to my television, 
A good criminal lawyer never asks a question in court if he does not already know the answer. Isn't that how that works? Guys, if your wife asks you whose underwear is on the floor, she already knows the answer. <laughs> Identifying the owner is not what she's after. Jesus was not asking Bartimaeus what he wanted as a means to get new information from him. He asks the very same question that he had asked the disciples in last Sunday's passage. What do you want me to do for you? James and John had made one of those say yes requests. Not ready to hand them a blank check, Jesus had pressed them to be more specific about what it was they were asking. Now he asks Bartimaeus that very same question. I can kind of picture Jesus glancing over at James and John when he asks it. As though to say, listen up. Listen to how you should have responded when I asked you. This is what you should have been asking me. Bartimaeus, who had been relegating to begging at the roadside, is the one through whom God's message would reach these disciples. It's through this man the religious community had passed off as irrelevant or even under God's judgment, that they would understand what they should be seeking in Jesus. My teacher, let me see again. Bartimaeus did not seek out Jesus quietly. He was unashamed to make his request known. Indeed, he had no reason in the world to keep it quiet. He had a desperate need. Everyone around him clearly recognized that need and its desperation. Timidity to ask Jesus for healing and vision would not have accomplished anything more than what he already experienced daily as his lot in life. He came forward loudly, increasing his volume and insisting while he had an opportunity. James and John had come to Jesus in private. They were hiding their request from the others. They didn't want the rest to know what they were asking. To some extent, they appeared to be ashamed of what they were doing. As though there were something wrong with their request, and they already knew it. There was. They just weren't willing to accept it. If we jump back to that feature story of Jericho, Rahab would normally have been ignored as having nothing of import to share. She was the one to tell the spies that Yahweh had indeed already won the upcoming battle in Jericho. Why her? She wasn't one of the Hebrews. She didn't serve Yahweh. She was no prophet. She was a very unlikely candidate to serve as prophet and mouthpiece to the Hebrews, wasn't she? She was the one, however, who delivered the message that Yahweh was in charge and had their well-being well in hand. 
Bartimaeus was just as unlikely a candidate to teach Jesus' disciples. Through his response, however, Jesus led them to another stage of personal reflection, recognizing that their request did not fit within the framework of God's reign. While the disciples had ample eyesight, they were struggling to see. They could not understand just how different in character God's reign was to all they knew of political and social realities and their hierarchies. Jesus had told them more than once that God's reign was about service. That God's reign was about love, about feeding, about healing, about forgiving, about reconciling. They had all heard all of those words, hadn't they? They had even seen Jesus' actions right up close, reflecting everything he had been telling them that they needed to be doing, and that these were the things of God's reign. It was never about power, privilege, victory in battle, wealth, or prominence. Somehow, despite the many ways Jesus had told them, they failed to see the truth. They failed to grasp what Jesus was teaching them. They had eyes that worked, but they could not make sense of what they saw right in front of them. They heard Jesus' words, but did not understand. Too many of us remain as vision-challenged as they so often. When will we learn to seek new vision, to be redirected by Christ?